Good evening. We are in hour three. Today is the State of Black Health 2024 for blackdoctor.org. I am your host, Dr. Renee. And to, this one is called Healing Together, Overcoming Chronic Diseases in the Black Community. So needless to say, there are a lot of chronic conditions in our community. So we have three fabulous doctors that are going to talk about them. Before we do that, though, please share this broadcast because I know that you have some family member with something, diabetes, asthma, um, anything, uh, lupus. Uh, there, there's so many chronic conditions. Just please, please share the broadcast. I don't care where you're watching from. Share it, share it, share it. And if you have questions, you can type them in the chat. I will try to get them addressed. Um, let us know where you're watching from. And um, those that are watching the replay, thank you. And let's get started. So today we have Dr. James Thompson, Dr. Cree, and Dr. Latanya Riddles-Jones. So fun fact, Dr. James Thompson was my allergist. He's leaving me, but <laughs> I'm, I'm still I'm not right, but I'm, I'm going to get right. But um, so Dr. James Thompson and Dr. Latanya Riddles-Jones have both been on before, but Dr. Thompson, please tell everyone just a little bit about yourself. Oh, sure. First, thank you for the invitation. I, I really appreciate being among such esteemed um, companions here. Uh, so I originated in Chicago. I'm a native of Chicago public school system. Went to a school called Lindblom Technical High School and went to University of Illinois for my training in, pre, in a pre-med program and then matriculated there to go to Washington University in St. Louis. Spent four years there and graduated 1980 and then went to um, University of Illinois in Chicago. Spent three years there in internal medicine re residency and then stayed an extra year for chief residency, then went back to Washington University for training in allergy and immunology, and then joined a practice that I am still with 34 years ago, practice of allergy and asthma and immunology in the Chicago and greater Chicago area. I was working out of three offices, but now as I, as I kind of we have reached my waning years in practice. I'm in one office in Orland Park. So that would be my story. I'm also a medical director of Healthy Living with the Vision Foundation, and we address healthcare disparities wherever we find them, regionally and online. So that's nationally, internationally. And we're just about three years into it, and that's been taking up a lot of my time also. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Cree. Hey, I'm Dr. Cree. I'm a board certified family medicine physician. I specialize in helping everyday overwhelmed, overworked individuals learn to live a healthy, happy whole life. I hail from Birmingham, Alabama, where I am the sole owner of Brownstone Healthcare, um, which is a direct primary care um, practice. I'm the medical director for the city of Birmingham's employee health clinic and the medical director for the Living Well um, HIV and PrEP clinic. So I do lots and lots of things and prevention is my game. Thank you for having me, Dr. Renee. <laughs> and Dr. Latanya Riddle-Jones. And so I was so happy to hear prevention is your game because that's my game too. <laughs> hey. so I'm Dr. Latanya Riddle-Jones. I am a uh, professor at Wayne State University School of Medicine, the Associate Center Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Carmenos Cancer Institute, which is a comprehensive cancer center here in Detroit. Um, hail from Inkster, Michigan, Michigan State undergrad degree in chemi my chemical engineering, uh, MPH at Harvard, and just, you know, Wayne State is my pride and joy right now. Um, I'm teaching 60, 70% of the time and, and I love it, but I'm internal medicine and pediatrics uh, trained. So a little bit about me. Thank you so much. See, I told you guys, I brought some really great people today. So I am so excited. So um, let's start out with, <sighs> what are a few of the chronic conditions that we you guys see that are in our community? Whoever wants. Um, I think we. I see a lot of high blood pressure or hypertension, a lot of diabetes. Um, I can see that all day long in different shades, shapes, form, and sizes. So I'll I'll stick to those who and high cholesterol being the three, big three that I see on a regular basis. Now I think that you just blew some people away because I don't think that they realize high cholesterol and high blood pressure were chronic conditions. So I'm very glad that you said that out loud 
because I think people, and even diabetes, you know how people say I have a little sugar? Just a little. A little sugar. Diabetes is a little more serious than a little sugar, you guys. <laughs> you need to take it seriously, too. And, when, and, um, so, and then also, because you both ladies talked about HIV, I think a lot of people seem to think that it's gone. All we have to worry about now is COVID. No, 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 no. No, 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 not at all. And HIV is a chronic condition now. We are able to manage HIV really well with medications. And so my patients who are, you know, living with HIV, they're managing their HIV really well, but it's the diabetes, the hypertension, the hypercholesterolemia um, that Dr. Creed mentioned that still seem to be the problems. Um, and I want to add on depression. Let's add depression on there as a chronic condition. And so Dr. Th Thompson, the reason why I go to Dr. Thompson is because I have asthma. And so most people don't realize that asthma is a chronic condition that you, you don't, you don't have um, asthma, do you don't grow out of asthma. You just have controlled asthma like I do. That's very true. And it's probably even to this day with all the advances, it's underdiagnosed. A lot of people I, I still run into that don't have the diagnosis, but have this long history of coughing every time they have a cold and missing days of school or missing sometimes several days of work, but they have bronchitis, they've been told, and they've been given antibiotics and you know all kinds of treatment. My wife was one of them years ago. I've been married for uh, 37 years. And she, uh, when we first met, she had a history of bronchitis uh, since she was 16. And not, not continuously, just every time she has a cold and seasonally, but she hadn't been diagnosed. So she's just one example of many because you can cough and you don't have to wheeze. You don't have to have shortness of breath or chest tightness. All those are, those are all symptoms of it, but it's a syndrome and it's a syndrome that can get better even on its own. And sometimes that's why some people think that they have something else that they may, but when they have a severe case and they have to go to the emergency room or hospital, it often gets exposed at that time. So it is very, it's still um, undermanaged and underdiagnosed, but yet there have been lots of advances now to keep people more comfortable, keep them at work and at school so that they can use preventive medications and preventive um, household changes, you know, like preventive uh, care at home where they can reduce their trigger factors once they've identified them. So we've come a long way. Yes, because I actually had um, perfect attendance all four years of high school, but I think I probably had it all the way through at least most of elementary because I would get sick at night and I'd go to school the next day. <laughs> I was really big on school. I was like, and when I missed school, fifth grade, I was in the hospital for five days. So that, I, that ER visit led to an ambulance ride to the children's hospital. So, but... Um, but yes, very well controlled. I don't take daily medications anymore, but I tell you exercise is what saved me, I do believe, because I started this crazy thing called running. But yeah. <laughs> so can you please, and we've had several shows about it. We actually just had um, a show on um, uh, National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day about PrEP. So can you two ladies please educate this audience here about PrEP and how amazing it is in us to be able to get this far to discover this? You take away, Dr. Jones. I'll, I'll, I'll pick it back You'll up. add on. All right, not a problem. Um, so PrEP, there are three medications that are approved for PrEP, for pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent the acquisition of HIV. Um, they are 99% effective if taken as prescribed. And so we have two that are pills that can be taken daily and another medication that is injectable. And that injectable medication can be taken once a month or once every two months. And so that's changed the game. Um, I have patients who travel internationally, they need their prep, their medications can't get the refills internationally. And so they get that injectable medication and they can be across the globe, globe trotting for two months before they need a, a refill of their medication or a, a new dose of medicine. Um, Right now, the population that I really want to encourage to take up PrEP is, is Black women. Um, you know, it gives you some power. Um, you, I, I have many patients who are in relationships where they, they don't feel empowered. Um, they feel as if um, they are, you know, at the beck and call of their partner. And, you know, really, you don't have to be. So um, 
just prep is just get changed the game and the injectable medication is, is, is amazing. So um, I'll let Dr. Creek take it from there. But. Um, I will add that you may have to be creative with getting your prep. I'm in um, Alabama. We in the Bible, black belt mm-hmm. of the world. So uh, a lot of primary care physicians do not necessarily feel comfortable with writing prep. So you, I have a lot of people that come to our clinic. We do a night clinic. So we got a non-traditional um, clinic. So I have people come as far as counties away, Talladega or Atlanta, name, you know, you name it, they drive me into our clinic, maybe Mobile even as far south, because one, it's getting you out of your neighborhood to get your medicine. Um, and two, you, you just may not have providers that are comfortable in that regard. So don't get discouraged if you find it, if you extra primary care about it or your GYN about it, then they say they're not, they don't do that. There is someone that can do it, the drive a little way. You're talking about visits, be um, three to six months, um, usually, but it is taking that drive. It is worth empowering yourself and taking your sexual health by its horns, you being your own advocate. And yes, most of my patients are not women. And I would love to see more and more women, Black women, getting. Um, the pre- prevention and the protection that we need. So when you say it's a shot, do you have to, um, the doctor has to administer the shot or you do it yourself? What is? Yes, the doctor has, the doctor has to administer the shot. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you go into the clinic to get the medication. Okay. And these medications are covered. They are covered by insurance. They're covered by Medicaid. And so that's the the big myth is oh these expensive they're the expensive medications they used to be they mm-hmm. but they're covered now so everyone has access okay. and even with us for people that don't have insurance there are grants the the um, pharmaceutical companies have have programs so no matter your situation go ask the questions get comfortable with somebody that you know that you can trust to say this is what I need. What kind of resources can, can you help me get to 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 use this? Because it is a great medicine to have. Mm-hmm. On. And don't let anyone tell you you don't qualify for it. Correct. Thank you. Everyone. You know, and, they, and I don't know if people paid attention. There was commercials when it first when they first started coming out. Mm-hmm. Still commercials. <laughs> and the commercial specifically said you had to be. I think born a male or something, and I was like, oh. uh, "That was a they dropped the ball in that regard." I think with the um, with the advertising, because when people think of it, you mainly think of men who have sex with men mm-hmm. or transgender, you know, right? Female and like, no, we need more commercials, different commercials, because and then now you'll see if you yeah, watch- now they've changed. Now it's changed, but still, that still seems like the overwhelming. You don't just usually mm-hmm. see just a woman and a man. It's usually a, a variety of relationships, you know, on the on the commercial. So people still probably are tuning in that part. Out. And I don't know. They just weren't specific. I didn't know what they were talking about until I talked about it on Black Doctor with a pharmacist. Mm. I was like, oh, that's what she's an HIV pharmacist, and I was like. Oh, I didn't have a clue. I said, I've seen the commercial. I didn't know what they were advertising for. And you a whole doctor. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> this drug and what? And I mean, I never could understand what are they talking about? And I was like, oh, and so, yeah. And so now I think that's really important that we just make sure people understand any and everyone can use these drugs. Yes. Down to age 12. Okay. okay. The pediatrician in me wants y'all to know. If you're 12 and up, you can get this medication. It is effective. And covered. Look at that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, um, and then, of course, we know next month we have Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, and Black Doctor has a couple of things planned for that as well. But, um, so, you brought up a very good point, Dr. Cree, about medication. So, Dr. Thompson, you and I both know some of these meds are ridiculous in price, and I have good insurance. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. And I'm finding it more and more challenging every day to select a medication, not only that's appropriate for my patients, but that they can afford, that they have access to. And it's becoming more and more difficult as insurances increase, deductibles and 
And as the prices of these medicines go up and co-pays go up, so it's, it's become very frustrating because here it is, we have, you know, a, a smorgasbord of various medicines that you can tailor to people, antihistamines and nasal sprays and inhalants, but they're becoming less accessible because of cost. And here it is, we're trying to prevent, and if we can use medications to control our airway problems, then there won't be these attacks that end up having you miss nights of sleep or miss school or work. Yet, if you can't afford these controllers, you're going to be in trouble. And a lot of times it comes down to, okay, do I go get this medicine or do I you know, pay my, my heating bill? You know? so, so it is becoming more frustrating and we have to be more creative. But we also need to be probably a lot more vociferous about how these companies are doing these things. You know, the, the political aspects of this, we need to become actively involved, meaning doctors in stopping this, this escalation of prices that happens primarily in the U.S. You cross the border, different story. Yep. I'm headed to the Capitol in May to do my diligence. Um, last year, we talked about um, SMART, the um, you know system for the medications, and we, we talked about how they need to allow doctors to be able to go in at level whatever, rather than having to go through the whole thing and um insurance should cover it because if your doctor knows that the level three drug works for them you then they should not have to go through one two to get to three but in order for it to be covered by insurance you have to go through one two three it, which is just ridiculous but that's the way it is and dr Cree said exactly what i did with my dad we had a medication that was um i think for the three month supply it was over a thousand dollars or something it was crazy and we, um, I went and looked up the medications. Um, I looked up the pharmaceutical company and found something online. And they text me to, instead of mailing you a card, they text you the little number, took it to the drugstore, and huge discount. So you have to really do what you can. And um, and that reminds me of high blood pressure. I was in a. Tr there's. Um, did you know this, Dr. Thompson? Inglewood is the um, has the highest rate of stroke deaths in the country. You knew that? I didn't know. So I went and um, we were at St. Sabina and we, Amron was giving out blood pressure monitors and I was doing blood pressure readings and there were so many people who had 200 over like 100, 200 over 90. And I was like, oh my God, we need to have the ambulances lined up. They're walking around. They just walking around. <laughs> well, they've, been, they've been living like that for they years. Like that. So. Like that. Reset. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm over here nervous. Like, are you having headaches? Are you seeing double? Are you okay? No. So what a lot of them were saying was that they had skipped their medications. You got to make them last. You got to stretch them out unfortunately that's the thought yeah the atrocity is that in inglewood the lifespan the average lifespan is just mid-60s and you just mm -hmm. go a few miles down the road to the ivory coast mm -hmm. or to streeterville and it's in the 80s right wow and yep. it, it, it just blows me away because hypertension is preventable and very treatable with diet and lifestyle and conventionally trained doctors like myself don't get enough training and nutrition none of us not just yourself none of us right. none of us right. at all got that no and i and i stepped outside the box about six years ago and got training for a year in integrative nutrition and it just opened my eyes to how blind i've been mm -hmm. i used to think that once i prescribe um, as i'm an internist also and i i would occasionally prescribe some blood pressure medication and i would tell patients years ago well that you're gonna need this for the rest of your life i really <laughs> believed it but that's how i was trained mm -hmm. And type 2 diabetes, same thing. But these are actually reversible. Mm -hmm. Even if you've had them for a number of years, not 100%, but greater than 70% of the time you can get off medicines. And I'm living proof of it because for 25 years, I took three blood pressure medicines and a cholesterol wow. medicine. And once I went totally whole food, plant-based, mm -hmm. within about six months, I was off all of them. And my numbers are better than ever. He's a pentatonner too, LaTanya. <laughs> Yeah, so I so we need to I've integrated this into my practice. When you eat healthy, your asthma's better control. When you're not sucking up all the milk and dairy products and cheese. The inflammation is down, yeah. Oh my gosh. COVID mm -hmm. is better. I mean, there's mm -hmm. studies that show that you are more robust against COVID if you eat less meat and a whole lot more plants. 
So a, a lot has to do with our food choices and what we do, what we don't do. You mm -hmm. mentioned already, doc, uh, Dr. Renee, about exercise. It's so important. Mm -hmm. And so is sleep. Oh, yeah. yeah. So important. And water. Yes. Mm -hmm. Basic things. Breathing. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Don't forget about then we exactly, Dr. Cree, everyone says, oh, I can't because I can't afford this or I can't afford to eat like that. I can't afford to exercise that I can't afford the gym membership. You don't need any of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although clean water is skeptical in parts of my state, right, Latanya? But yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that could be an itsy bitsy problem because you might have to buy water over there. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but um, water is so essential and you could just walk. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It is amazing what just walking can do. Uh -huh. And I understand you may not be able to walk outside your door. Okay. Walk uh -huh. around your apartment, house, condo, whatever it is. Yes. Walk in place in front of the TV. Just walk. Uh -huh. Because you, 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 you can have blood pressure medications. Uh -huh, uh -huh. There's so many things that they can do. I'm always like, well, if you can't get to the gym, you can YouTube. Everything's in YouTube. Put your exercise, put your arm. On a chair exercise because I got bad arthritis, and it'll give you something to move mm -hmm. your arms, kick your legs. You know, so there's so many different ways that we can um, to do better. I do want to add that there is a diet out there called the Eat Right for Your Blood Type, the Blood Type Diet, um, and it is really good as well. It's more used, you know, overseas. Japan is big into that. They in the, there's an app called Eat Right for Your Blood Type. So if you know your blood type. You can put it in there and it says what are green foods that are help you, yellow foods that won't hurt you but won't help you. Put it in it says red foods that you should stay, you know, you should stay away from. So that's something to add to. So that's science based because I've heard about this book way before I even went to med school. I heard about that book. To use it, I actually have done it, and I feel so much better eating right for for my type. So I think talk to your physician, of course, about it. And come up and see if that's a great plan for you. But yeah, I feel good when I eat right for my blood type. And then, Dr. Thompson, I have a question. This is probably the silliest question. Why do we use the word plant based and not vegetarian or vegan? Well, vegetarian, I'm, I'm not muted, am I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, vegetarian has some other implications because vegetarian. They usually eat fish. Yeah. Well, the pesca vegetarians, and pesca oh, okay. vegetarians. Yeah, then you have the lacto ovo vegetarians, and they eat, you know, milk and and eggs, but they don't eat any, eat any other meat, fish, you know. Those. So you have these those, these subtypes. So vegetarian doesn't necessarily mean whole food plant based. Gotcha. And I, I generally like to use that full term, whole food plant based, because vegans are plant based, but not necessarily healthy eaters. You can be a junk food I, I, vegan. I, I agree. It's a social justice movement. It's not a diet. It's to save animals from from slaughter and, and abuse and exploitation. And so, if you eat, if you drink Coca Cola and eat Oreo cookies, um, you're you're a vegan still. There's no animals dying from that. Right. Right? But your heart, <laughs> your heart, and your and, and your cancer risk and all that will still be high and, and risk of diabetes. So healthy vegans actually eat whole food, plant based. Mm -hmm. So that means minimally processed food and plant-based meaning that it came out of the ground is something that does not have a mother it came mm -hmm. out of the ground and generally anything that comes out of the ground that doesn't have a mother you can pretty much say is plant-based if it's an edible and it's 20 th there are about 20 to forty thousand choices out there you know people think i'm gonna miss my meat and all that every every quadrant of of plants has protein the greens and other vegetables the fruit the whole grains and the beans they are, they are, they're all plant-based and they all have protein. You know, the last thing you're going to be in this country is protein deficient. Now, you, may, <laughs> you, you may be tired and feel like, oh, I need, I miss this meat because maybe you started off raw vegetarian and you eat nothing but plants and fruit. Well, yeah, you might be missing some protein and some, you know, some stock there because you really need to have a more balanced start with some beans. Pick your beans. Whatever, there's like 12 different kinds of beans and whole grains, not the white flour. The quinoa and, and mm. teff and sorghum. There's a several different grains you can have out there. They're very healthy. They will fill you 
and your gut will like it because there's, I think the greatest area of research in the last decade has been on that gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is like second to the brain and what makes you who you are. So it's very important since, and we're talking about COVID and HIV, well, 70% of your immunity is in the gut. And as an mm -hmm. immunologist, I really appreciate that because I learned that a long time ago that that gut, those patches down there really dictate your level of defense. And so what goes down in that gut, every meal is important. So make it, make it healthy. Yes, yes, yes. I, well, I, I don't know about plant-based, but. <laughs> well, if, if not plant-based, just I tell my patients to shop the perimeter of the grocery yep. store. Yep. Just start with that. Mm -hmm. My medical students look at me like deer in headlights. Like, what, what are you talking about? Never heard that. My mom told me that as a child. Right. So just. You know, you won't have the processed foods if you shop the perimeter, at least for the most part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just saw something. Um, three things that mimic fish because I'm allergic to seafood. So jackfruit, banana blossoms, and lion's mane mushrooms. Wow. So that's my new thing I'm going to try. I, unfortunately, the local grocery store had none of the three. <laughs> so, so I think I'm going to have to go to a special grocery store. But I'm gonna yeah, try. Sometimes you have to work a little hard to, to mm -hmm. eat healthy. Mm -hmm. But I know it is about substitutions because that jackfruit it can taste like some pulled pork. You know, if you know what you're doing, right. that sauce. <laughs> yes, that jackfruit mm -hmm. doesn't look good. I mean, I went and saw where's this jackfruit in the produce section? It looked like a watermelon that 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 had chicken pox. I mean, I was like, <laughs> wow. This, um, but you know, you have, it's not the outside you eat, it's the inside. And mm -hmm. you just, when you go through some recipes, there's some great sources, forks over knives. There's something mm -hmm. called the Whole Food Plant-Based Cooking Show on YouTube. Um, there's, there's some Afro-Vegan Society. There are a lot of resources at that. PCRM.org on YouTube. They have a whole section on recipes. So it's really just a matter of making those substitutions. You can have your dessert, nice cream, taste i mean people think oh well bananas frozen banana is gonna have a banana taste not frozen something about when you freeze it and cream it up and put some strawberries or blueberries or some cacao in there or some vanilla extract you gotta shake a healthy shake instead of that dairy product that's gonna you know increase your risk for for men prostate cancer even some evidence for women some uh, breast cancer and, and so it, you know it's it's really just about substitutions yeah. And I, I mean, I'm all about the, there's, I do a lot of substituting because I try to stay on the right side of things and I don't want too much of this and too much of that. Too much of anything is a bad thing. So, yeah. but it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful thing when I can tell people they don't need to take their controller inhalers anymore because they stopped the dairy and the cheese and the highly salted and processed food. And then they tell me, you know what? My face is clearing up too. I'm like, <laughs> oh. Really, you don't have those bumps on your face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's great. The eczema's control, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and I, I drink only oat milk, and that started uh, somewhere around 2016, 2017. And, and I was a two-gallon-a-week skim milk drinker. I loved it. And then I went without it for like 90 days, and when I went back, I was all of a sudden... <clears throat> And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I haven't done that in so long. I'm like, what is that? And I said, oh my God, they're right. Yeah. And so yeah, I'm great, great, great grandmas used to say, you know, cut that milk out when you got the flu, you got a cold. They would say, stop giving them milk. It makes mucus. They knew what they were talking about. <laughs> yep. Clear liquids. Yep. Jello yeah. and water and stuff. Yeah. So hypercholesterolemia, how can we uh, combat that? What are we eating besides plant-based? I was about to say, I think y'all just gave us a whole lot of things. <laughs> I mean, that is probably the way to go. And I'm always like, think about your fats. You know, if we just cut bacon out, you know, we just didn't have bacon <laughs> in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> that's so that's so hard, but okay. I know, but I'm like, if we just put back on our bacon and our fried chicken, you know, the way we prepare things around mm -hmm. here, my state, I think our cholesterol numbers will be would be much better. But you guys are probably in healthier states than me and the obesity capital of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm like, watch if we, we fry everything. 
because of your, your good cholesterol, you need to increase your good cholesterol. Let's increase fish. And they're like, well, I'm eating fried fish. I'm like, okay, not that kind of fish. And that the Catholic that we in our hospital system, we had fish every single Friday. And then finally mm-hmm. they start adding some, some bait options. So I think that it is going to be thinking about the way we prepare things and back up off our bacon. That's, a, that's what I recommend. So I am a huge proponent for the air fryer because I do like fried chicken, but the air fryer makes you think yes. it has not even, I mean, I think if I put a tablespoon of oil in there, that's a lot. I don't think I even put that much. Exactly. That is a very good alternative to get that fried chicken taste, um, but I don't know. It's a struggle. I'm begging folks to get air fryers and and put it in the oven and do something. And you can even bake it in the oven, too, because before the air fryer, I baked my fried chicken, too. I've never fried chicken a day in my life, I can say, and I love fried chicken, but I've never fried it myself because I think that it just looks very scary. And <laughs> I've done it once, so I agree with you. I'm in Alabama, so you know I fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> mother's from the South, and we do not recall her frying it either. My mother doesn't either. Neither so. does my. Mm-mm. I think that that was just, you know, as a matter of fact, grandma, I would, you know, and this is, you know, she was a great grandmother, but, you know, I would sing in the choir and she'd say, okay, let's go get your KFC, Renee. So, okay. That was a reward. The exercise is good to combat it as well. You've right. got to get that, to that HDL level up, right? And so, oh, that see, was, exercise, I didn't know, see, exercise can help with that too. Mm-hmm, absolutely. But also the thing we don't talk about enough is family history. Family history mm-hmm. plays yeah. into hypercholesterolemia significantly. Yes, so. I remember my first cholesterol test was in eighth grade and, and my numbers were elevated. Mm-hmm. It didn't make sense. I was an athlete. My BMI, my body mass index was normal. So where was that coming from? That was coming from my maternal grandmother. Mm-hmm. So it, you got to know your family history. We got to talk to each other. You're yes. right. Yep. Yeah, that's and that's why it's that's why it's important to to get checked because that's mm-hmm. you know you get those numbers those are important numbers to look at not just your total cholesterol but your LDL cholesterol and realize that if you have you have used just that you're using just that air fryer with just maybe a teaspoon of oil and you're doing all these things you're exercising you're eating a lot of veggies and that cholesterol is still 220 230 you got to do more you're going to have to give the chicken up you're going to mm-hmm. check Chicken just has about 6% less saturated fat than beef, okay? So if you're making it work by moderately changing your diet and your numbers are good and you've got your weight down and everything's work clicking, you know, fine. If your doctor says everything's fine. But if they're not, then you're going to have to go further. And that's what I had to do because I did all those things. I was eating just lean pieces of meat. I stopped eating all beef and pork and I... I just couldn't get off those three pills. I got it to the lowest level, but I couldn't get off those three blood pressure medicines or Lipitor, a Torvastatin, I guess I should say. And so, um, but it wasn't until I went all the way, when I went all the way, <laughs> that I was able to get off and stay off the medications. And I don't want to look back. And once you get away from these things for a few months, you don't miss them. I, I grew up on fried chicken. I grew up on liver. I loved all this stuff. My palate could take anything. So I didn't stop chitlin. <laughs> but I, you know, liver already. Good Lord, you guys want well eat chitlins. I know that's right. I can, I can, I can take this. Well. Um, but really, I don't miss those things. I look, I crave plants now. My taste buds have come down to earth because I used to eat a whole roll of Chips Ahoy. That was after dinner. <laughs> I mean, a roll of Chips Ahoy, you know, three Snickers bars. That was, wow. that was just like heaven to me. But. I don't miss those things now because my taste buds aren't oversensitized by this high mm-hmm. sugary stuff that we get, you know, that gets in, in our in our eyes. When, you know, when we look at commercials, when we go billboards, when you go shop, what's the last thing you see before you go to the cash register? All the <laughs> yeah. candy bars, rainbow of, of mm-hmm. processed all sugar. The sugar. Oh mm-hmm. God! And right, the kids level. You know, they have them down low where the kids mm-hmm. can reach it and all that. They do they everything they do. They know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That is too funny. That is too funny. But you know that there's um there's some vegan chitlins, right? Yes, I do Why? know about that. I'm glad you know about I that. I do wow. know about that. I wonder about those, but I'm not a connoisseur in that area. 
Yeah, I didn't. I wouldn't. I mean, just like I said, I never had fish, but I was like, this whole little fish thing sounds interesting. But I have no interest in the whole chitlin thing. They also have vegan oxtails. I'm so sorry, but I don't think that that's something I'm going to try. I'm just it, might, it might be okay for some. It's okay. For some. What is it? I'm just going to eat my oxtail. Well, the other thing is fiber. High cholesterol, you need yeah. your fiber. Exactly, and that doesn't say. So oatmeal, you know, oatmeal is usually my my dessert at <laughs> after I eat because I eat so late. Then I eat oatmeal before I go to bed, and well, that's a good still so cut oatmeal. That's fine. Mm -hmm. That's that's mm -hmm. good. The thing about vegan food, though, sometimes people have this misconception that all vegan food will solve their cholesterol problems, and and you know those Beyond Burgers and. And impossible burgers, they're loaded with saturated fat. Now, mm -hmm. yes, they're not animal fat, but when you use <laughs> coconut, <laughs> when, you, when you use that coconut oil, that's 90% saturated fat. So you're kind of in the same boat. You're not harming any animals, but you're not doing any good for your cardiovascular risk either. So you have to be careful. Read those labels. Oil is oil. Even olive oil, they all have the same amount of calories per tablespoon. They all mm -hmm. can jerk around your blood vessels and make you unhealthier. So if you really are struggling with cholesterol, you need to watch, you need to really ratchet down those oils, all oils. So that might be a little more cooking at home. Sorry, guys. A lot more. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, because you can't control what they're doing at the restaurant. Mm -mm. No, no. Unless you're going to go to the restaurant and eat salad and ask for your dressing on the side. Yeah, it's kind of boring, but you can put some things together. I always tell people just prep, you know, know what restaurant you're going to. Now, if you're going to an upscale restaurant, the chefs usually make it a challenge to really please you. So you'll come back. I've had some of the best plant based platters at some of the higher end restaurants. People look around, they got the meat on the plate, they're looking over at my plate trying to get some of my <laughs> square, square mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and yams. But, um, you know, really. Just do your homework. And one thing I found, too, if I don't really know what's going to be where I'm going, is I don't go real hungry. You know, I have my yes. healthy meal or healthy snack before I go to the event. And then I'm not feeling like i got to have whatever's there. Well, the food allergies, that's what I do anyway. Because I'm, just, I'm like, usually I can't eat it anyway. So, therefore, just eat before I come or I'll make sure I eat when I leave. And yeah. my two smuggle products that I smuggle in at times is my dressing because I make my own dressing with cashews and balsamic vinegar, some lemon, mm. uh, and I uh, and some nutritional yeast. They give you a cheesy flavor. It's healthy. It, a lot of it has B12 in it, too, which people that are vegan or, or uh, whole food needs to, need to take some B12 supplement. And so I'll, I'll have those two things sometimes that I'll sprinkle on whatever food I get. I think, I think for cholesterol, it's important from what I'm hearing from Dr. Thompson is uh, recipes, you know, get creative. I don't think that, I think that we do just what the few recipes you've learned and just kind of stick with this is fast. But I think if you plan and get some recipes and put in there, you know, good low cholesterol meals, that, that may be a, a good help. And then it also will have you try new things. Exactly. And I think that um, we're lazy and we will Google everything else, but we won't Google that. Mm -hmm. Because I understand if you didn't grow up watching somebody cook this way, then you wouldn't know how to cook a different way. Like perfect example is the people who will cook greens all day. Those greens were done about 20 minutes into your cooking. Yes. And you took every nutrient out of them, which mm -hmm. is the water's green, when you finally get the pot open at eight hours later. The pot liquor. You talking this? Right, you gotta drink the pot the liquor. liquor. No, but it, it, you and I, and the both, all of you know that you done, you have got no nutrients in these greens. <laughs> that is the point. You not even eating a vegetable at that point. Mm -hmm. So you need to learn a new way of doing it. You can saute those greens <laughs> quickly. You can. Um, I put it, I put them in the the um, slow cooker. They were cooked in three minutes. Yeah. It was yeah. an instant pot. It w and I put them in three minutes. I was like, oh my god. My mother goes, no way. I said, mommy, they were done. The <laughs> greens done. They were so good. So you just have to change the way you do things. And the only way to do that, if you didn't see anyone do it, please Google it. Yeah. Google it. Just like you look up anything else. Look it up. Mm -hmm. Look it up. 
And, you know, there are a lot of foodies. I mean, we've turned into foodies. There are a ton of these cooking shows. People, I have relatives that watch these cooking shows for hours. I mean, not healthy cooking shows. But, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you could just Google something healthy and, you know, stop having your pains and aches and taking 12, you know, 12 medicines um, by just spending a little time and learning online. Now, for me, I used to always turn to these about four or five different sources but now, since I'm into this for so many years, I know what I know. I know I know the uh, seasonings I want to use. I know <laughs> I know I'm gonna have different beans every week. I'm gonna have a different grain. So I rarely go to recipes now because I've picked up on what I really like, and I can be creative on my own. And I try to be diverse. There was something called the American Gut Project about eight years ago that showed that, on average, if you eat about 30 different plants per week you have a tremendously healthy gut, which means that parlays into all the other things that your gut influences, like your cardiovascular, your cancer risk, and your immunity, and your hormone balance. And so I always try when I'm at watch shopping that periphery, when I make that right first to go to the, to the uh, produce section, it's usually a right, sometimes a left. Um, I know that I'm gonna spend most of my time there and then in the dried goods section. And I'll put together some things that I know that I personally like, so. Uh, it's a little tougher if you're dealing with the whole family, though. I understand. My kids okay. are grown. My kids are grown. I have parents tell me, well, you know, what about my rest of my family? <laughs> so. But if you start them off eating this way, they don't know any different. That's exactly. true. Because, like, my cousin, her daughter is two, I think. She don't know nothing but plant-based because that's the way she eats. Best thing. I wish I knew that years ago. So, but um, what I was going to say was... Um, Lord, I forget. Yeah, my brain just froze on. Well, but um, well, but yeah, you got to be plant. You got to start them young, so then they'll 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 be you know regular. It'll just be a part of what they do, and they won't know till they go to school. They will be like, "You don't eat what?" You know, that's when they'll find out. That's right. Well, the Dr. Thompson was uh, talking about herbs and spices. Those fresh herbs, you can grow those in your home. And guess pot. what? You don't even have to live in a place with a yard. You can grow them you in your house. Not. You My sister not. Can it, in her apartment in Jersey. Mm -hmm. And it can replace salt. That's Those right. seasonings, if you use the right fresh herbs, you don't need That's salt. That's right. I know what I was going to say. I didn't like broccoli. And if I ate it, it had to be doused in butter. And so, you know, my sister's a chef. Dr. Cree, you're the only person that doesn't know me outside of my, in my real life. These two do. My sister's a chef, a trained chef. And so she would put the broccoli on a tray and put seasonings on it and put it in the oven. It would be so good that I would literally be standing in the kitchen at the pan. Mm -hmm. and I've already ate my plate. I'm sitting there finishing off the pan. So I did this. I did the same the other day. Ate the whole pan myself. It was so good. <laughs> but when I tell you, I was like, I can eat broccoli now because I couldn't stand it. So that's being creative. That's being creative. Yeah, it's about it's about seasoning and it's about texture. And mm -hmm. chefs know how to do that because there are people that used to hate Brussels sprouts. Ooh. I know. That was me. No. That was me. Oh, that's <laughs> my you favorite. Have, you have them done the right way. If you have them done the right way, you love yes. those little Brussels sprouts. Yes. So I used to slice them into thin, so it was like slaw almost, and I would saute it. It was phenomenal. Yeah, then I would make them, and I'd put bacon in them, bacon bits in them. I mean, mm -hmm. I... I had all sorts of ways, but I had Brussels sprouts, but it's funny. The way that we ate them as kids was awful. My sister goes, they had flavor. I go, I know, but I liked them. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't like them until I started I didn't cooking like them until I was a brown woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Try roasting some cauliflower, too. It's like, like, it's like it's 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 everything. Yeah, cauliflower is kind of bland, but when you roast it and you season it, mm. it a little they bit can, of lemon. some of these chefs can make cauliflower Tastes like those. What are those wings? Like oh those, yeah, uh, buffalo wings. Mm -hmm. Buffalo wings. <laughs> yeah. We've had those. You can have cauliflower buffalo wings, cauliflower steak, mashed cauliflower. Because I like mashed potatoes, so I could eat mashed potatoes mm. every single day. But then I look like I eat them every day. So um, we just eat mashed cauliflower every day. Well, cauliflower, cauliflower rice. rice. Yeah. Right. Yep. Exactly. Can do so Saute. Much mm. Yeah. And yes. it's a vegetables. It's, it, you know, it's not green, but yet 
it's packed with a lot of antioxidants and fiber and vitamins and minerals. So it's a very healthy choice too. Things that prevent cancer. Yes. Because mm -hmm. we didn't even bring up cancer. That's chronic. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah. We didn't, we didn't bring up cancer. Mm -hmm. And, but I mean, there's so many, so let's talk about the cancers that are preventable. The major, HPV. Ones. Huh? the major ones. Yeah. Cervical cancer. Yeah. Cervical. Prostate. 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 Uh, colon. Yep. Colon cancer. Yes. yes, yes. Yeah. And colon cancer. Fiber is your best friend. Mm -hmm. You want to prevent colon cancer, you need to increase your fiber intake. Absolutely. And we don't, most people's diets, they're not eating enough fiber. So here in this bottle, I have my fiber supplement. And it's in every bottle of water that I drink because I want to make sure I get my fiber. And I had my colonoscopy and they said everything looked fabulous. So it's working. I had mine too. Age 45. You need to Eight call your girlfriend Let's start. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and tell her. <laughs> that, that is on the list of things to do when you want to prevent colon cancer is to have a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, you guys, I know you see those TV commercials about Cologuard and they look oh so happy and lovely. But I'm going to ask you three, would any of you tell your patient to go use Cologuard? So, so I actually do for those who are dead set against getting a colonoscopy. Yeah, I was about to say. If you're not going to get a call, like colonoscopy is by far a gold standard. You'll know what you need to do the next five to 10 years. But if you just don't want to do that, okay. Before I default to that, I, I'll share them um, an anecdote that my wife uh, about 15 years ago wanted to skip the colonoscopy and I, I kind of badgered her into getting it done. Uh, she was 50. And she um, decided to uh, go ahead and get it done. And it turns out she had a walnut-sized cancer that she had no idea she had. There no blood in the stool. Colagard would have missed it. It wasn't bleeding. It was stable, but it was malignant. Mm -hmm. And so she didn't need any chemo. She didn't need any radiation. Because they removed it in the colonoscopy. They removed about a foot of her bowel. Right. The bowel pretty long. You can go without a foot of your bowel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she still telling me what to do every day so so it's mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a beautiful thing and she became the poster child for all her friends and for all the friends <laughs> it's just screening oh, I, I, have no idea. I have no idea that's <laughs> a beautiful thing it's prevention and it can be treatment uh -huh. and it can it's be cured. Not awful yes. it can be cured. the fastest five pounds i ever had lost in my life <laughs> well, yeah, get your bowel set on track for a while. <laughs> well, and that's the worst part. Lighter. The worst part is the prep. <laughs> yes, it is. The, the, the procedure. Part. They you you go to sleep. That's a good sleep. Right. Yeah, yeah I hate to say sleep. it. I look forward to it. I like go. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that, that prep. You just got to get through the prep. And there are different types of prep. Right. If you, because like my mom, you know, growing up, I would see my mom with that big thing that you added water to the powder. That oh, looked God. disgusting. You know, they got the nerve. Little, little oh, drink, right. drink, and it was, you knock it back. It was no big deal. It was done. Yeah, they have the nerve to call that, at least in this go area. Lightly. Go, go, lightly. go lightly. Yes. I tell them, you are not going lightly. No, you're with not this. going lightly. Yeah, you're going to be going running, is what you're going to do. <laughs> oh, gosh. I hated that. I did that one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I liked my little bottles of liquid. It was clear liquid. I even put my little drink stuff that I put in my water in it. It didn't really help it, but I drank it. And, and then the other thing, because I couldn't, um, because you couldn't eat, I drank bone broth, and I felt like I was eating soup. You couldn't tell me. I had it with a spoon and everything. Couldn't tell me I wasn't eating with everybody else. <laughs> so it really was not that. Like I've. I've had much worse experiences than that. That was nothing. My stupid allergy test was far worse than that. So, so and it lasted longer, and that pain was awful. And so, that scratch test was a nightmare because I was allergic to everything under the sun. So it was it was awful. So my it's arms. Not a nightmare back. for everybody. <laughs> well, it, for me, because my arms and my back, because yeah. everything was on fire, and I was ten, and I'll never forget it. But that colonoscopy was a breeze. A breeze. Now, the digital rectal exam for men and prostate may not be considered a breeze, but it's very important, <laughs> it's especially, very important. especially for black men who tend to go yeah. show up late for the for the exams mm -hmm. and end up having more advanced disease, sometimes more progressive. So yes. we we need to really be on top of making sure we have our prostate screen. A combination of the digital rectal exam 
and the PSA. PSA. That's mm -hmm. very important. And then if you have a family history, Dr. Jones had mentioned the importance of knowing your family history. Mm -hmm. If you have somebody that has a history of prostate cancer, you need to have screening earlier. Yeah. Five, 10 years earlier. Same with colon cancer. And breast cancer. And breast, yes. right. Oh. Yes. Most all of them, I would say, if we really let's start yes. screening early. Yeah. yeah, so you can't wait. And breast cancer, especially in black people now, you you can't wait till that 40. Uh -uh. And <clears throat> look, colon cancer in a minute, it'd probably be 40 instead of 45 because they had us wait until 50, and that wasn't a good idea. So now it's 45. But like I said, it'll be moved up probably in the next two years or something. And, and it's the standard American diet that sets us up for that. I mean, yep. the standard, mm -hmm. standard American diet has 60% processed food and about 30% meat. And the, um, the World Health Organization and American Cancer Society almost 10 years ago had overwhelming evidence. They have these, the way that you actually catalog evidence, A, B, C, and you know, it was category A, the highest level of evidence basis that when you eat processed meat, you're talking about bacon, bacon, ham, sausage, um, mm -hmm. cold cuts, hot um, dogs, those the hot dogs, those increase your risk by 15%, mm -hmm. more than 15% for cancer. So, you know, why take those risks if you don't have to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's right. So we have to wrap up. I need everyone to let everyone know how they can contact you. We'll start with you, Dr. Cree. Um, you can contact me on Facebook. My page is Dr. Cree and me. I look forward to hearing from you. And we can continue this conversation for days, but prevention is the best way. Dr. Jones? You can find me on Facebook as well, Dr. Riddle Jones, or you can email me at um, lriddle at wayne.edu. So L-R-I-D-D-L-E at W-A-Y-N-E dot E-D-U. Dr. Thompson? Yes, um, I can be located also. I have a Facebook page, Mindful Eating and Nutrition Services. Mindful Eating and Nutrition Services. And I have a website, fearlessmd21.com. Just like it sounds, fearlessmd21.com. The fearless is an acronym for holistic health. Uh, you can, first page on the website, you'll see what that means. And then lastly, for those who are interested in any kind of online community services that for passage of information on all kinds of things, especially diabetes and prevention, healthylivingwithavision.org. That's healthylivingwithavision.org website or on Facebook. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I appreciate you all for giving us your time this evening. And uh, we will see you on the next one, everyone. The next one is about what screenings men and women need to have mm -hmm. in different stages of life.